part two. Um, this is a, a modified, shows you the difference between APTE here and APTP there. P train was modified so that the tilt jacks were horizontal. Um, secondary air springs everywhere. The tilt centre was still in the same place, but there wasn't a physical ball joint in the middle, like there was on E train. The idea being that if you took the hydraulic pressure away from the jacks, the vehicle would pendulum itself back so that the floor was parallel with the track and then you could lock it off and then there was a tricky hydraulically driven ratchet arrangement inside the bogies that locked it still. So it, also the articulation joint wasn't quite the same. Here's E-Train with the things actually connected in the middle. P-Trains aren't like that, they've got a tilting bolster at both ends with probably the world's biggest bogey in the middle there and they're not pin jointed which did make life a little bit difficult later on. Um, in order to test this, we used another test vehicle. And this picture shows three generations all in one go. Here's E-Train in the middle there. Right there, that corner there, that's the very first prototype P-Train trailer car. But the halfway house between them is that one there, which we called Lab 4 Hastings Coach. And there's Hastings Coach in all its glory. It was a Hastings line buffet car that was a fugitive from the Hither Green disaster. Um, because the Hastings coaches were vertical sided, they could tilt and still stay within gauge, albeit only six degrees. One of our engineers, Stuart Dick, knew that there was one of these lurking around somewhere in the railway system but didn't know where it was. The, um, uh, what the hell do they call that control system that told them where the trains were? Tops. Tops, correct. Yeah. Tops didn't go that far at that time. We couldn't find out where it was. One day, Dave Grant, him with a grin, he and I were travelling down to Southampton to see a supplier down there. And as we approached Mitchell Diva Station, I was facing forwards and Dave was facing backwards in the compartment. And Dave suddenly leapt up and said, there's a Hastings coach in the yard there. So we hurled ourselves off the train at Mitchell Diva, went to see the yardmaster who was a bit amazed to see these guys, we flashed this vast pile of passes at him to say, you know, one of these must work. We want to see your, your Hastings coach. He said, oh, that would be the paint store. He said, oh, right. <laughs> so we went over to see the paint store and Dave climbed up the side and opened the doors this, and was instantly buried in about 100 tins of paint. <laughs> so he was lying on the ground completely surrounded by tins of paint. Luckily, none of the lids came off. So we said to the yardmaster, you're going to have to find a new paint store, mate, because we're having this one. So um, Hastings coach was sent back to Derby. Um, it was travel. We built some new bogies, APTP type bogies, which were called at the time H4Xs. Um, the middle bit was built as a VIP compartment. Eight seats in there, air conditioning, um, double glazed windows, carpet on the floor and up the walls even, red carpet. Um, this end have got the laboratory end with all the uh, control systems and instrumentation. The other end had got the tilt pack, uh, in this case a Mark III tilt pack, and the air compressors and all that sort of stuff. Um, it had bar couplers on the end so it, would, it could tilt while going on normal track. There's the H4X bogey. There's the air spring in the middle and that's the tilting bolster. That round bit in the end there is where the tilt jack was bolted onto. Hastings worked pretty well pretty well straight away. We'd learnt a lot of lessons, of course, by then. Um, it's on our way back from the test track going around Syston Curve. You can see there clearly the difference between a Hastings profile there and a normal Mark I profile on Lab 23 there. And that's just down the road from here. That's a Sandbach station, <coughs> tilted over at six degrees, which is as far as it would go. And we used the line between here and Longsight as a test track because at those, in those days it went over the Cheshire salt mines and the track profile was never the same two days in succession. You've driven on that, I bet, have mm. Yeah, terrible all, ride. All ready to suicide. <laughs> yeah. Jack it up all the we thought it was wonderful because yeah. um, we, we only had two Mark III tilt packs. They were used to test components as well as testing the system. On one particular occasion we had a failure at crew and phoned back to Derby and said we need the other tilt pack out here and they said oh we've got a problem because the contractors who were taking our stuff around with wagons were arguing the toss about the contract and we couldn't get a truck to bring them out there. 
So one of my colleagues, Nick Breary, said, why don't we put the Mark III pack in the Craven's parcels card? We've got a Craven's um, DMU parcels DMU. card there. Take it out to the station and swap them over. Good scheme. So we got a special notice racked up. We took Hastings coach and its train down to... Uh, down here to Sandbach on this side of the island platform and after a short while, this was about eight o'clock in the morning I might add, along came the parcels car on the other side and the doors of Hastings coach whipped open and three or four blokes hustled this tilt pack across the platform and there was another tilt pack coming across the other direction putting it past and then the parcels car took off and shortly after that we took off and this time there was a whole load of passengers stood on the platform going what the hell's going on here? This, these completely mad guys. That, uh, it worked quite well. Um, there you can see that's under the test bridge at Old Dalby. This, the track here was slewed across so that the profile of the bridge there was closely to the C1 gauge so we could test whether it was um, fouling the gauge or not, which it didn't. Oh, let's go back to there a minute. The Hastings coach was used all over. Every, the only place it didn't go was the... East Coast Main Line, but went everywhere else. At one stage, we even ran it on passenger trains, on the back of passenger trains from Wolverhampton to Houston, so it would tilt going south but not going north. Um, on one occasion, doing the crew to Carlisle tests, um, we're coming south from Carlisle, heading towards crew fairly early in the morning, once again at rush hour. And uh, as we are approaching Wigan, um, they said something wrong here we can see a drop in hydraulic pressure so I said oh, I'll go and have a look and I went back towards the this end of Hastings coach to have a look looked through the window into, con into the hydraulic compartment couldn't see a thing it was as if someone had dumped a cloud in there <laughs> oh dear. I thought oh dear big hydraulic leak we got for safety reasons the electrical switch gear was outside there was something when you switched off anything it didn't get a spark and set fire to the hydraulics so I hit the sh the stop button to turn the hydraulics off and called up the inspector and said slow down to normal line speed and said okay so all that happened. Unfortunately at the time we didn't have the tilt pack in a drip tray so all the oil which was over in the atmosphere coalesced down to a normal oil and went out of the train underneath the doors at the side just as we're going through Wigan station. So all the, the rush hour passengers there ended up with, well, it dissolved all the ladies' tights because it sprayed across them at this oh, other oh, oh, And the guy's trousers were sort of heavily marked. So by the time we got back to the traction depot here at Crew, I was on the biggest carpet you've ever seen. Uh, but it's difficult to know what else I could have done. But, uh, I suppose I could have not turned the thing off, but it didn't occur to me. Needless to say, we built a very big drip tray after that. <laughs> um, in order to test the articulated bogies and the production tilt packs, they put skins on pop train, which spoiled it to my mind. And that's got production H4Xs there, which are BT12s, Rob? Uh, BT12s at the end, Rob. Right, that's it, BT12s at the end. And the monster BT11s in the middle. And there's the Mark V tilt pack. That's pretty much the same as the ones fitted to P train, except the electronics were up inside. And we had the Mark V underneath there and the Mark II inside, just in case. And later on, that P-Train prototype trailer car was put into the middle. And that's Lab 8 there. So it ran two articulated bogies, and that had a real production tilt pack underneath. In order to test the Mark IV tilt packs and the power car bogies, we built this monster this is the Trestrol with a BP-17A bogey. It wasn't actually powered, although it had got um, the gearbox and the card and shafts and the HK brake up inside here. And you can see this linkage up the side. That's the anti-tilt pantograph, so that as it tilted over in the corners, the pantograph went the opposite direction to stay in, centred over the catenary. And that was tested all over the system again. Um, that's under the the bridge at Old Dorby again. It only ever went one place, one journey ever with a human being on board. It unfortunately the human being was me um, going out to Old Dorby the first time. Once again its amenities were a kitchen table and a kitchen chair 
and I'm sat there where the, the drive shaft, which is about so diameter, was whizzing around this far away from my ear, and the noise level was horrendous. And apparently I was sort of wandering around the place looking a bit dizzy when I got off, and they decided that human beings weren't travelling around in it. Then we came to the real thing, APTP. And, of course, you can see the real thing sitting right outside there. Um, P-Train prototypes ran from 79 onwards in various configurations. And you can see there with the, the setup with the power cars in the middle, as we spoke about before, that was because you needed 8,000 horsepower to get up the slopes on Beta and Shap to get them running fast enough. Um, they were designed to run 155, although service APTPs never did. Um, the normal configuration was two power cars in the middle and 12 trailer cars, six on each end. Um, and you can see the arrangement there. The accelerometers were not on the body, they're on the bogey frame here and the position of the body relative to that was sensed by a different sense of this LVDT. It stands for Linear Variable Differential Transformer. I, you all know to know that. Very handy to know that, you? just in case anybody you come across it in normal conversation. Um, and that system worked pretty well. They worked through two or three different types of the control system on APT during, during its service life. And originally it worked just like Hastings Coach. Later on... Um, it had what's called a precedent system inside. The vehicle at the front actually signalled the next vehicle along in the train um, because that gave it an advance warning for the corner. And right towards the very end, it ran a tilt system so that the tilt didn't go as far as the maximum. If you were going around a corner that required nine degrees of tilt, it would actually only tilt as far as six degrees, which meant that the passengers would still feel a small amount of sideways force and the reason for that will become obvious later. Um, I, I left BR in 79 but I stayed in touch with the, um, the system because I wanted to travel on the first P train um, and I gave the London Midland people a tough time about it and eventually I got this letter that said I'd been allocated a ticket you know, as if there were 40,000 people wanting to travel. Actually, the very first run, 7th of December 81, there were only 13 fare-paying passengers. That first run was from Glasgow down to Euston, and it left at about 6.45 in the morning. Oh, I travelled up to Glasgow overnight. Well, I travelled up my car the previous day, stayed overnight, and got the train down in the morning. And that's my certificate and the ticket for it there. Um, these are some pictures from that first run. And... It was completely fault-free, despite what the press would have you believe. Most of the people on the train were actually press or VIP people. Um, and I knew the track very, very well indeed, having spent lots of time on Pop Train and Hastings going over it. Um, and, of course, December, at that time of the morning, it was completely black, especially in Scotland, couldn't see a thing. Um, and it was as if they'd straightened the track out. You couldn't feel the curves at all because the tilt system worked so well. Until we got south as, as far as south as Abington, where the, the, there's a long, long, long left-hand curve goes around a very big hill. And going around that curve, you could just start to see the light coming up and you could see, see the horizon going up and down as the train was going around the corners, at which point all the media guys started to throw up. Well, of course... This had nothing to do with the fact that the previous night they'd spent the time in the bar at the um, Glasgow station on BR's expense getting completely mm. pie-eyed. Absolutely nothing to do with it at all. And then they gave the train a completely awful write-up afterwards. And the train sickness, tilt sickness bit has carried on since. The plain fact of the matter is, just like some people are car sick and air sick and sea sick, some people are tilt sick, end of story. The great majority of people aren't. Um, but the business I mentioned about having limiting the tilt angle later on in P-trains, um, that's meant to help people like that because you've still got a small amount of lateral force, so you've still got what you can see out the window of the horizon going up and down still agrees with what your balance canals can feel. And most tilt systems in the world do that to this very day. Pendolino certainly do. Um, 
the rest of the story of P-trains pretty much goes down the line. Um, BR at the same time as that were starting up the intercity market. But it, BR having changing to the, um, the intercity side, the marketing areas, didn't really help matters. And the guys in charge, I think, lost heart with the P-train. And immediately after the December 81 disasters, because the, the one trip I was on was the only one that worked 100% of the time. The other ones were suffered from uh, tilt failures on the northbound run the same day, HK brake problems. But the biggest problem was it was one of the worst winters for years. And the pantograph would ice up and the train would run short of power, etc., etc. And they took the train back out of service uh, pretty well straight afterwards. And it was only in service for about three or four days. And only in the middle of 1982 did it ever get back up to speed. But they didn't put it into regular scheduled service so that you could come along to Glasgow to go down to London and find yourself in London three quarters of an hour earlier than you thought you were going to be because they just ran the train to an APT programme through spe special notices all the time as far as I could understand it which must have been pretty much fun for the operators um, but eventually they gave up with the plan and the whole thing was came scrapped in 85 the project came to a halt in 85 and you can see here it's being scrapped and you um, Rob and Brian have got some pictures further down the exhibition coach of the different parts being scrapped at different places, which is pretty bad, um, most depressing. But luckily, this train, which is a development train, was saved for posterity. And after a time in the loco works here, ended up here. Um, the other power car, 49006, was claimed by the NRM, who promptly did their usual trick when it comes to stuff like this and put it in the siding and left it there for 20 odd years and um, the state of 006 before it um, when it left Kynaston was absolutely awful um, it came up to Shildon for a few days and I saw it there the day it arrived it was just terrible and then it spent another time at the Electric Railway Museum at, um, at Coventry and eventually arrived back here and all of a sudden in a period of about two months. Brian has worked wonders on it, so you can see it out there. Really, really nice. Yeah. Meanwhile, E-Train was still up at York, once again being cared for by the NRM, who left it outside for 26 years. Um, trailer Car 2 was inside, and uh, inside the Great Hall, this end mounted on an E1T bogey and an SA bogey at the other end. We had a small tilt pack in the pit underneath there, and it would tilt backwards and forwards under a manual control valve, but it worked pretty good. But the health and safety guys, as soon as they start going, decided it was far too dangerous because heavens above the hydraulics run at 3,000 pounds a square inch was just far too dangerous, despite the fact it had been standard industry for at least 30 years. But of course, they are health and safety people, so we know nothing about that. Here you see E-Train in all its glory sitting outside, <coughs> and you can see how well they've looked after it. Yeah. And they didn't do anything to it for 26 years. And until 2000. Now, the aforementioned Paul Dudley, nine years old, that's him there on this end in the high of his vest. In the meantime, he'd formed an APT support group with the idea to keep the thing going. And um, he set up this website. All the time, I knew nothing about this. And uh, they were planning a meeting inaugural meeting of the group on the 1st of April, good date, 2000. The Tuesday before that, my secretary at work decided she wanted a railway coach for her garden. I mean, everybody has one, don't they? And I'm thinking, Donna, what are you on about? She said, well, you know all these railway people, you know, in five months. So I think, yeah, all right then. So we started to look through the internet. Eventually, she did actually buy one from Pete Waterman, as it happened. And I don't know if it's still in her garden now, but... Uh, in the process of this, I came across this website called apte.org. I thought, what the hell is all that about? So I read all this. So I thought, blimey, this bloke's really keen. They're having this inaugural meeting on, oh, it's next Saturday. I thought, oh, I'll write him an email. Hello, my name's Kit Spackman. I used to be tilt development engineer on the APTE. Perhaps I can be of use to your support group. Paul, to this day, said it was a bit like getting an email from God. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes after that, he phoned me up. He said, are you really Kit Spackman? I said, yeah. Wow, you know, um, yeah, 
please come along, you know, we'd love to. So I went up there and they treated me like royalty, which is all a bit embarrassing. Um, sitting in my tilt control seat there for the first time in 26 years, pressing the go button. And uh, the rest pretty much is history. The group formed up. We started to work week every month. It's all this sort of work here. We had to replace the windows. We replaced the floor, replaced the carpets. Trailer car two was okay because at that time it was under cover, but um, power car one at the other end was a disaster area because it had been vandalized and still is bad. Power car two, we took all the skin panels off, de-riveted them, repainted it, de-rusted it, riveted it back up again. Um, you see that's the process there. Got the lights working so we could work inside. And we spent four years doing that. Repainted it on the outside. See the state of the turbines and the state of the that's with the skin panels off here, the tilt jacks and the steering beam, etc. That's the world's last steering uh, swinging arm bogey, which was holding up one end of trailer car two. And eventually they decided um, to move the whole train up to Shildon. Um, the length of the train being the determining factor of how long the Shildon train shed was. And this is moving the trailer car out. Um, use the same handling dollies and these had to be lowered so that the skin there was right down on the bottom of the trailer going under the Lednam Road bridge. There was not enough clearance between the top of the trailer car and the bottom of the bridge for me to get my hand in. You just couldn't do it. Of course the power cars wouldn't go under there because the exhaust ducts were sitting on top. So the power, you see the exhaust ducts on the top here. <coughs> so some idiot I think it was me actually, had the idea if we coupled both power cars together we could tow them across to the thrall yard which was the old carriage on wagon works and take it out that way. So we did exactly that. Um, the taper joints, the bore joints upon which it pivoted, trying to get these off was a major operation <coughs> and entailed jamming a point blade under there with about ten of us jumping up and down on one end until it came loose which it did eventually. And then as you can see down here mm the joint module fell over, so that was a drama getting that out. So we coupled both locos together. Um, that picture up there. The meeting at the NRM meeting was pretty good because the network rail, it might have been rail track, no it was network rail then, they had everybody and their mother was there. And the network rail guy was no, you can't possibly do that. I'm, I'm sure they never did this during the 1970s. And, you, 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 you know, you need qualified staff um, people who worked on it for some period have got experience with these sort of things and it's, it's absolutely important we do that so I can't really see what we're going to approve so I said do you think somebody like the um, tilt system engineer for the system yes somebody of that sort of stature I said that would be right then because that would be me and he went oh <laughs> <laughs> having dug himself a hole yeah. we then filled it in on top of him which was all rather and Paul knew what I was going to do because he was sitting there with this huge grin on his face so we did the last Move. I've still got the logbook, I might add. It's in that green bag down there. And I filled in the extra thing for the last move across to the thrall yard with the timings and everything on it. With a very good line, officer in charge of the train case, back when first time ever. I was dead chuffed. And then we had to take them up to Shields on these road trailers, which was, the whole thing took three weeks, and it was just purgatory. And eventually we filled it into... Have any of you been up to Shildon and seen it? No. Yeah, you are. No, you are. Because yeah. <laughs> um, it's been under cover now since 2004 and we've been working on it continuously since then. And Power Car 2 and um, Trailer Car 1 and Trailer Car 2 are all open to the public at times. Um, tilt systems are not operational, so we've had to make it um, block them up so I develop these giant support structs underneath. But eventually we're going to replace those. We found the drawings for the original tilt support blocks, so we're going to make some new ones. That's the inside of the cab as it is now. Oh, think about crash. Those are the crash beams I was talking about, either side of the driver's head. And that's pretty much like it looked in 72. And most of the warning lights still work. That's the inside of trailer car one. Um, there's a video screen on the end there which is exactly the same shape as the original Speedo. We run the tape of the 152 mile an hour run with Ray and Brian and <coughs> Alan Goodley all doing their thing. 
and, and it synced to the speedo which comes up on that screen and we had an open day reunion day some years ago um, and we couldn't find these antimacassars on the back of the seats there weren't any of them about and I could remember what they looked like and I drew a sketch up and Paul said yeah we want it to make it authentic and Tuesday of the week before I was up in my loft and I found a real one oh. Oh. so I, I tried to scan it on my scanner but it was too big so I put it on the floor took a photograph of it sent the picture to Paul he took the dimensions off it went down to the local place in York and they printed off 40 of them so and we got them the very morning of the reunion so they yeah. the trailer car too has been refurbished in turn by these two lunatics Malcolm Wilson Barry May who were working on the train back in the 70s and they all this instrumentation all the channels all the controllers uh, the UV recorders Many of them have been, were still there, but the amplifiers were all being taken away. Bombardier gave us their whole stock, because they had about 200 of them in stock. They gave us the whole lot, because they don't use them anymore. So the thing looks pretty much like it did back in the 70s. And that's it there, you can see that. My tilt control panel there, which is all looking pretty good. And that's the, the reunion event. There's the Dr. Wickens in charge of it all there. And one thing you can see that that's the prototype Deltic there, mm. obviously. How small e train is compared to the prototype yeah, Deltic. It's, it, it's like it, a yeah. tiny little tube train. But the reason it's so low is because the, you'll note the top of the exhaust ducts are there. They're level with the top of the, the mm. Deltic. And that's pretty much as it is today. There we are. Okay. Right. Really excellent. Pleasure. Pleasure. Well, thank you for having the endurance to sit through all that lot. No, you're, you're <laughs> a very, 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 life, a very challenging one. Yeah, yeah, and rewarding in some respects. Yeah. Good. Thank you.